Turn your Bibles, if you have them with you, to the book of Daniel. Daniel in the Old Testament. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Daniel. About three quarters of the way through the Old Testament. Actually, Ezekiel is between Jeremiah and Daniel. As I've been praying about the new year and how I can best reflect God's heart to our church family, it, this is not the first new year for any of us. And many of us in our culture, though we may not write them down, we spend some time reflecting on what do I want to be different? What do I want to see changed in my life? And may I say God has the same priority. I read this week about a man that uh, bought a hunting dog. Now, I'm not a hunter, but I know Carrie and others of you out there are and would appreciate this. But he bought a hunting dog, and he had that dog trained to help him hunt bear. It was up in the northeast or northwest. So he took the dog out one, one season, and the dog caught the smell of a bear and started howling and, and running off, and the man started charging after him. And all of a sudden, the, the, the dog stopped and sniffed around and shot off in another direction. And so the man stopped and realized, well, I, the tracks say this way, but the dog says this way. So I'll, I'll follow the dog. He's trained. He knows what he's doing. And then the dog stops and sniffs and shoots off another direction. It wasn't until the dog, he finally exhaustingly caught up with the dog and found the dog barking down the hole of a field mouse that he realized what had happened. The dog had started chasing a bear, but then a deer had run across the tracks, and the dog got distracted by the deer and started chasing the deer scent. And then a raccoon had somehow intersected that and got distracted and started chasing the raccoon. And eventually he caught the scent of a mouse. And it occurred to me in that story, we are, not, we are kind of like that. We start off pursuing something of, well, we think of value at least, but there's so many things that cross our path that, that pull us away. So I, I thought it would be profitable to try to, as we're considering going into this new year, how to navigate some principles. I'm only going to share one to, to this morning, and I'm, hopefully we'll share one or two more this evening. But how do we, we're not chasing bears, but we are trying to navigate through some pretty dangerous currents how do we navigate with all these distractions in our lives that pull us off? Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever read, read Homer's Iliad. It used to be required reading when I was a boy. But it's a magnificent 2,600-year-old story. You may not refer, recognize the, the reference to the siren songs, but Odysseus traveled through some waters that were haunted by seductive sirens that would call the sailors and pull them into a dangerous place where the ship would be sunk. And there are many siren songs in our society, many seductive, promising, this is the path, go this way. And many times we follow them without really paying attention to where they're going to take us. The Bible says in Proverbs twice in 14, 12, and 16, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And we're also, as we talked several weeks ago, we're in a culture that, that is shifting currents. And, and the, the closer you get to Niagara Falls, the stronger the current becomes. And I'm old enough to have seen the power of the current of our culture picking up. And if we're not careful, we'll get caught in it. And the longer we stay caught in it, the harder it's going to be to get out of it. So how do we navigate through these? Well, Daniel was a young man who was taken and placed in the center of the most uh, 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 wicked, idolatrous, pagan culture you can imagine. The, the, the culture of Babylon, I'll give you one example. Before a girl left her teens, about 15 or 16, every Babylonian girl would be taken to a temple. And she would be sat there dressed seductively and sat there. And then any man in Babylon could walk by and pick one of those girls. And then they would rape these girls. And that was the initiation in the Babylon culture to womanhood. And that was just one example 
And this was all sanctified. It was in the temple of their God. And it was just one example of how debauched this culture was. God took Daniel and others like him from Jerusalem to the capital of Babylon. He was born as nobility. Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 1, the king, when he, when he captured Jerusalem, he didn't capture all of them initially, but he did take the royalty, the king's seed, and the princes, and Daniel was among them. And then he force marched them almost a thousand miles to the capital of Babylon, these princes and this royal people. Some of them were chosen specifically so that they could be, go through a three-year training course. And the Bible calls them children at this point. Now, we're not told their age, but in the Jewish culture, you were considered a man at 13. So it's entirely possible these were 10, 11, 12-year-old boys, and they were in, it's chosen and questioned, and then they were found to be intelligent enough where the king said, we're going to train them to be diplomats. The king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat. In other words, anything pre prepared for the king, they would take and, and, and put in this little college, this little prep school, and that the, these captives from the different cultures that Bab uh, Nebuchadnezzar had captured would be basically be able to feast like a king every day. And nourishing them three years, at the end thereof, they might, if they pass, stand before the king and basically represent their people to the king. In, in this part of this transition, they actually changed their names. We only have the names of four of the Jews. There were many more. Among these, these Jewish nobility was Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Every one of these names had a reference to God in it. God's name, literally, Don, means judge, and El is a reference for God. El Elyon, El Elyon. God is my judge. So Daniel came and he was raised and every time his parents or his friends would speak his name, there would be a reference to God. God is my judge. Now think about that. The Bible says a good name is rather to be chosen the great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. If, if every time you heard your name and you recognized the significance of that name, it was tied to God. It, it would possibly have some effect, effect on you. Uh, who was the oldest man that ever lived? Methuselah. Do you know what happened when he died? The flood. If you look at the name Methuselah, it means judgment comes at death. For 969 years, every time Methuselah heard his name, what was God sending a message? At your death, judgment is going to come. So Daniel grew up associating himself with the reality is God is the only judge that matters. Others will judge me, but God is, it's God's judgment that matters to me. Well, they changed his name to Belteshazzar, which is a Babylonian name that means Bel will protect him. Bel was the God, primary God of the Babylonians. So yeah, Daniel, God may be your judge, but Bel will protect you from God. That mean, oh God. Most of the Jewish youth, can you imagine being ripped? There was a siege, they were starving in the city, the walls were broke down, the Babylonians got in. They didn't destroy a lot of people, they just took a handful of the royalty, but they forced marched them in slavery. For a thousand miles, however many months that took, these spoiled noble youth are dragged like common slaves, and they don't know to what fate. Then they get there, and they're separated, and some are put, sent to the palace with a big feast. What would be going through your minds if you were one of them? Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> this isn't at all what I thought it was. So they saw this as good news, but Daniel didn't. The Bible says when they got to the table and Daniel realized that this, this food, some of it was forbidden by God's law. Now, I'm not here to talk about the Old Testament dietary laws, which, by the way, are no longer binding on us, according to the New Testament, but they were binding on Daniel. Daniel and all of the other Hebrews had a very simple choice to make, didn't they? I didn't use the word easy. I used simple. Did they know what God's law said? Absolutely, they knew what it said. Now they have a new law in effect, the king. So this was a simple choice. Am I going to violate the law of my God in order to honor the law of my king? 
It was a simple choice. It was not an easy choice. May I say to you that most choices that God brings into our life are really not that complicated. They're not easy. The problem is we want easy choices. That's why we keep making the wrong choices. But they are simple. God has said, you know, what part of thou shalt not? Don't we understand? No matter what version you put it in, thou shalt not. It's not, Mark Twain, who was an agnostic, said it's not the parts of the Bible that I don't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I understand very well. We may not understand everything God wants of us, but we know enough to make some of these choices. And they knew Daniel decided, it says Daniel purposed in his heart he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. Now he wasn't belligerent about it and I don't have the time to go into the details. I just want to focus on the point. At the beginning of this new stage in Daniel's life, he made a decision. And the word purposed is what the Bible used. He purposed in his heart, deep down, I don't care where I am, I know whose I am. And I'm going to honor my God no matter what happens. Bible tells us in Proverbs 29, 18, where there's no vision, the word vision, uh, chazon, it means a mental sight, a goal, a picture. When there's no vision, it comes from the root word chaza, and it means to gaze at on purpose, to contemplate. The idea is, here is not a telescope necessarily, it's a mental image deep in my soul, where do I want to end up? Going with the navigational term, if you get on the high seas and you don't have a goal in mind, it doesn't matter. You'll float wherever the current's going to take you, and too many people are living their lives like that. They don't have a purpose. Where there's no vision, the people perish. It's the Hebrew word para, and it means they end up dismissing something, turning back. In other words, all of us are pointed in a certain direction, are we not, by our families? Bible says train up a child in the way he should go. So parents' job, to some degree, with varying levels of success, we, we try to point our kids with a certain, level of, a certain kind of value system, yes? But when that child leaves home, and sometimes before they leave home, they make a decision about the values that they were taught. Is that not true? All of us do. Either I will embrace them or I will reject them. And they go off, and for using my analogy, they get in their own little ship, and they take off. And by the way, freedom is intoxicating. And most of us, if you go back in your minds, did you sail straight when you first left home? Many of us did not. We got caught up in some of these currents. But the danger is the longer we take to purpose in our heart where we want to end up, the stronger those currents come, become and the stronger the pull and the further away. So the Bible says if you don't have a vision, if you don't know where you're going, you're going to end up dismissing important values that are supposed to guide you. Most of the other Jews dismissed God's laws when they had now the freedom. Mom wasn't watching, dad wasn't watching, the priests weren't around, but who was watching? The eyes of the Lord are in every place, the Bible says. They dismiss God's law in order to get along. And, and from their perspective, even get ahead. They thought their ship had come in. Daniel stayed focused on his purpose is to honor God, and that's what made the difference. So I want to talk to you briefly this morning, and I will be as brief as I can, about the importance of choosing a prudent purpose. See, most don't have one. Paul didn't say, this thousand things I dabble, and he said, this one thing I do. Most do not have a clear or compelling purpose to their lives. They're basically in a survival mode. That's where these sl Jewish slaves were. <laughs> they were basically concerned about surviving. So if this is what I have to do to survive, then that's a no-brainer. That's the survival mode. It's getting along. The personal protection, peace, or provision is the highest priority. What's in it for me? What do I have to do to take care of myself? That's where most of these Jews were. This will usually produce a temporary relief, temporary pleasure. That young person who was raised in a home that they considered too strict, and now they're adults and they can make their own choices, do they regret some of those bad choices initially? 
Or are they still intoxicated by the freedom to make their own choices? That, that couple that's in a strained marriage and, 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 and they're not willing to make the, get the help and make the choices that are going to be necessary in order to repair the damage and they divorce or they split up, are they immediately, do they often immediately regret that or do they immediately feel relief? No more strife, no more conflict. So, lacking a clear purpose and slipping into survival mode often produces temporary pleasure. The Bible talks about Moses. He recognized when he had a choice, I can associate with the Hebrew slaves or I can remain a prince in the palace of Pharaoh. And it says he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season because he had respect under the recompense of the reward. He understood, I can reward myself right now or I can honor God and wait for God to reward me eventually. So being in survival mode, we reward ourselves for a while, but the very things we reward ourselves with eventually produce pressure. Without a clear destination, it's very difficult to even understand where we're going. If I don't know where I'm going, then how am I going to gauge when I get there or if I'm heading in a safe direction? I can't really, if I don't have a vision, if I don't have a clear purpose and a compelling purpose, I'll bounce around going wherever, fulfilling the temporary reacting to the temporary circumstances or fulfilling the temporary desires, if I don't have a direction, I won't even know when I'm drifting off course because I don't have a clear course. That's what I'm telling you. As you reflect back on this year, are you closer to God today than you were 365 days ago? And if the answer is, I don't know, you probably don't know because you don't have a clear way of measuring that. If you're drifting from God, but you don't know where to find God or how to find God, how do you know you're drifting from God? Many people confuse activity with productivity. We're all busy people. Most of us are. And and because we're busy, and often we're busy doing good things, we're not busy being serial killers. We're busy doing good, responsible things. But if God created us to do specific things and we're so busy doing other things that we miss the the things God created us to do, there's not going to be lasting fulfillment. And by the way, the very definition of the word sin means to miss the mark. Therefore, James says, to him that knows to do something and doesn't do it, to him that's sin because he's not accomplishing what God put him here to accomplish. Most are busy, and and the Bible uses this example in the last days, and and we build on the foundation of our faith, but some use wood, hay, and stubble to build, things that are just temporary, corroding, and some will choose gold, silver, precious stones. And if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says, when we transition from time to eternity, the only thing that's going to come with us are the things that God valued is gold, silver, precious stones. He uses the example of a fire. If a house is built out of wood, hay, and stubble with a couple of gold, precious stones, and and, and silver. The gold and the silver, the precious stones will survive the fire. The wood, hay, stubble won't. So as we transition from time, temporary time, to long eternity, most are producing wood, hay, and stubble out of their lives, but they think it's gold, silver, precious stones. This is what's important. Get ahead, get an education, get a relationship. Do what's going to make me feel satisfied And most people end up building their lives out of things that they think are gold, silver, precious stones. But from God's perspective, are wood, hay, and stubble. It's kind of like investing in uh, Confederate uh, Confederate currency. Trading in all of your gold for these pieces of paper, those Confederate uh, money. And what happens when the South lost the Civil War? What was the value of the Confederate money? Zero. But you see, in order to get the paper money, people had to trade what for it? Gold or silver or precious stones. And there are too many people. Satan's out here offering us confederate satisfaction. Confederate options and opportunities. And we're trading eternal uh, uh, values for it. Without a clear and compelling goal, we're like a ship without a rudder. We can drift easily enough because the currents are always there to pull us. Or we can be blown about with the winds of circumstance 
but we don't have the power to direct or drive towards the right destination because we're rudderless. A purpose is like a rudder. So most don't have a clear purpose. Some have a purpose, but it's heading towards a, the wrong port. It's short-sighted, it's temporary in vain. Solomon, King Solomon, was the wealthiest man that, that lived in his day. He wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, and the book of Ecclesiastes is his journal as he's navigating life, and, and, and with more money than anyone else in the world had at that time, more freedom and more power, and frankly, more intelligence. So he decided, I'm going to find satisfaction, but I'm not going to look for it in God. In God. I'm going to look for it under the sun. I'm going to look for satisfaction in temporary ways. 29 times in that 12 chapters, he uses the word vanity under the sun. Verse 14 of chapter 1, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, everything that's just done for temporary pleasure, they are all vanity, with hebel, unsatisfying, and vexation, raut, vexation of spirit. Raut means feeding or reaching on something that is empty, literally a mist. Trying to get a hold of vapor and realize there's nothing there to hold on to. He, like so many people today, climbed the ladder of success only to find in the last stages of their life that it's leaning on the wrong building. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 outlines three things that he pursued for a while. One was pleasure. I enjoyed pleasure. He had a thousand wives or concubines. He said, I withheld nothing from my eye, anything I wanted. I could afford, I could buy, or I could take. And he did. He said, but I, I enjoyed pleasure possessions. He bought everything he could. He, he made 666 talents of gold a year. And at today's prices, that's a couple of billion dollars a year. Ga I gathered me silver and gold. Accomplishment. And I was great. There was nobody like me. But in verse 11, he said, but then I looked at all the things that I had accomplished, all the things that I had labored, and behold, all of it was vanity and vexation of spirit. There was no profit, no long-term satisfaction in it. He writes the whole 12 chapters about his experiences, then he wraps it up in the last couple of verses. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of men. This is what we're here for. For God shall bring every work into judgment and every secret thing, we're not getting away with anything, whether it be good or evil. Remember, Daniel's name reminded him of this truth that Solomon, 400 years before Daniel was born, wrote about. Fear God, keep his commandments, because no matter how you enjoy life, remember what Jesus said? What's gonna, if you get everything and you lose your own soul, what have you really gained? Most have no clear purpose beyond themselves and survival. Some have a temporary purpose. I want to be rich. I want to be a doctor. I want to be this. I want to be that. There's nothing inherently wrong with goals as long as you recognize their short-term goals. But if I want to go, if I want to, let me say, I want to stand before God and hear, well done. That's my ultimate goal. But I want to go over here and enjoy this and, and, and over here and do this and over here. Do you realize that some goals will take me in the opposite direction? Now, some short-term goals will take me here and here. If I want to fly to Paris and I don't want to pay for a, you know, uh, straight flight, I'm going to have to fly to several different airports. Now, as long as I'm moving in the right direction, I don't know if you've ever booked international flights, but sometimes you don't move in the right direction. Uh, and, and, and you look at, why is this flight going to, why is this process going to take me 27 hours? Well, because you're flying east to go west. Sometimes we make short-term priorities or decisions, and there's nothing wrong with that unless those short-term goals are taking us away from our long-term goal. But few have a long-term, prudent, eternal purposes. I'm not here to tell you don't make plans and don't have dreams and don't, don't work towards things. I'm saying if you do all of that without this, then you're going to do like this, and you won't be able to measure where if you're making progress Daniel purposed in his heart the word purpose is the word sum it means he put it down he appointed it he determined it he committed to it he would not 
in order to accomplish his purpose, he had this opportunity and said, this will take me in the opposite direction of this. And since this was deep down in his soul, his purpose, it made this an easy choice. Simple. The issue wasn't his diet. It wasn't about eating pork or it wasn't even about drinking wine. It was his determination, his purpose to stand before God someday and hear well done. He filtered every decision through this. Proverbs chapter 3 puts it this way. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understandings. Why? Because your own understanding is going to take you all over the place. In all your ways, acknowledge him. The fact that he is the judge, you're going to stand before him someday, like Solomon said. Acknowledge him. And he will direct your steps. I open with this verse. Where there's no vision, the people perish. But, the last part of that verse, he that keepeth the law happy is he. The word keepeth, shamar, it means those who value God's laws. Not because God's, a, uh, 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 God's want to squish us when we step out of line. If that were the truth, there'd be, these pews would be empty. There'd be nobody preaching at you. God doesn't look to stomp on us. God doesn't give us choke collars. Sometimes I wish he did. You know, so are those invisible fences? You know, so when we step into sin, but he doesn't do that. Remember Christmas Eve, I used the illustration of the candle. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts. God just gives us the truth. And if we'll allow that truth to penetrate our lives, what truth? The truth that God is the judge. The truth is when, when I'm done with all my life and running every path that I choose to, God gives me the freedom to do that, I'm still going to have to stand before him and whether I live to 15 or 50 or 150, it's all going to be gone. And all I will have left with for eternity was what I did for God. He that guards or values the law, happy, esher, blessed. It comes from a word that means to make or keep straight. Go back to the navigation. We're trying to get somewhere. God blesses us by giving us the directions that are going to get us there. The word prosper means to push forward. It's like wind behind our sails that moves us in the direction that's going to bless us. Philippians 3, Paul says, this one thing I do, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. My question is, what do you prize? Because you know, you will press towards whatever you prize. And if you don't prize the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. If you are either ignorant of or indifferent to the fact that you're made in God's image, God gave, gave you life and blessings and prosperity and potential and resources and privileges, and someday you're going to have to account for how you use them. If you don't value that, you'll press towards whatever you prize. Paul says, I press for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, the opening chapter of Daniel talked about all these noble children that were enslaved, drug about 900, 1,000 miles away to Babylon. Many of them were given the privilege of banqueting on the king's food and training for positions of prominence and power. Only four of them, one was Daniel, but his, his influence affected his three friends. We never hear a name of any of the other Hebrews. We don't know what happened to them. Maybe they made it. Maybe they became governors or managers somewhere. We know nothing about them. We never hear from those who made that compromise. When in Babylon, do as the Babylonians. But as for these four in verse 17, that would be Daniel and his friends. God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. But Daniel had understanding in visions and dreams. And the king, they graduated after three years, and the king communed with all of them. But among them all, that would be all the Jews, all of the young people who had gone through, all, among them all was none found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. They were graduated, and they became the king's counselors. In conclusion, which best describes you? Do you have a clear, compelling, long-term purpose? 
If you do, is it really compelling and is it really long term? Or is it ultimately like Solomon's pleasure, possessions, promotions, pride? He said it was all empty. Oh, I enjoyed it while I got it, but it always left me empty. Sin will do that. It will always take you further than you want to go and cost you more than you want to pay. Or do you have a prudent, eternal purpose through which you filter all of the other choices that you make? C.T. Studd was a wealthy man, inherited a fortune, gave it away, spent his life in Africa as a missionary. He wrote, only one life will soon be passed and only what's done for Christ will ultimately last. Jesus in Matthew 16 made no bones about it when we're trying to decide how we're going to navigate our life. He simply said, if anyone will come after me, it's not a complicated choice, but it's not an easy one either. If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself. That's what Daniel did. Deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life, that's the choice those other Hebrew slaves made. I got to get along, I got to compromise, I got to violate, I got to sin in order to be accepted. Short term. Whosoever will save his life, make the easy choices, will eventually lose it. We never hear about those other Jews. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake, whosoever comes to a choice where it realizes, I have something to say about this, and I'm going to listen to God, what God says instead of what everybody around me is shouting at me. Whosoever will lose his life, I don't know how this is going to work out. This looks like it's a good choice, but I know this violates this, so I'm going to trust God and go with this. I lose my life, not physically, but what I want, what I see, what I can understand, because I'm trusting God. That's what, a, that's what Proverbs 3, acknowledge him and he'll be able to direct you. He will find it. Now, Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, because what is a man or a woman profited if they gain the whole world, if they get everything they want and lose their own soul? Or what can a man or a woman give in exchange for your soul? This week in our church family, we've had two people die. One, a young, young man, 21 years old, I believe, I don't know how old Wilma was, but an older lady who had lived much of her life. Neither of them woke up the morning that their heart stopped and decided, I guess this is my last day. The young man was tragically taken in an accident. The older woman through a debilitating disease. The clock of life is wound but once. No man has the power to tell just when that clock will stop at noon or midnight hour. To lose your wealth is sad indeed. To lose your health is more. But to lose your soul is such a loss as nothing can restore. This week I read about a young girl at the age of 12. She wrote an essay. I'm going to read you just a portion of it. She was a believer. She came to Christ as a young girl. Her name was Brooke Bronkowski. As a 12-year-old in junior high, she started a Bible study at her school. She spent her babysitting money on Bibles she could give to her classmates and tell them about Jesus. She wrote the following essay. You can Google it and look it up and read it in its entirety. Since I have my life before me, by 12-year-old Brooke Bronkowski, I will live my life to the fullest. I'll be happy. I'll brighten up. I'll be more joyful than I am, have ever been. I will tell others about Jesus. I will go on adventures. I will change the world. I will be bold and not change who I really am. I have no troubles, but instead, I will have no troubles, but instead, to help others with their troubles. Oh, for the naivete of a 12-year-old. You see, I'll be one of those people who live to be history makers at a young age. Oh, I'll have moments, good and bad, but I'll wipe them away. I'll wipe away the bad and remember the good. This girl's 12. I'll be one of those people who go somewhere with a mission, an awesome plan, and nothing will hold me back. I'll set an example for others. I'll pray for God's direction. I have my life before me. I will give others the joy I have, and God will give me more joy. I will do everything God tells me to do. I will follow the footsteps of God. 
I will do my very best. Two years later, she was killed in a car accident. 1,500 young people came to her funeral. Many of them spoke about the notes that Brooke had sent, the Bibles that she had given them. Francis Chan, it was, the little girl was in her church. He preached the message. He said almost 300 people, kids, came forward to give their heart to God. And he made this observation, and it, it stuck with me. That 14-year-old girl, because of the choice she made, at least as a 12-year-old, she couldn't choose how she was going to die, and neither can you. She couldn't choose when she was going to die. She thought she had her whole life ahead of her, but she decided at 12, I'm going to give God that life, and I'm going to obey him, and I'm going to start investing. What God has given me, I'm going to share with others. Almost 300 young people opened their heart to God at her funeral. You know, it occurred to me how many of us live to 80, 90 years old and can't point to three people who are going to go to heaven because of us. What made this little girl different? She had a purpose. What was that purpose? I'm going to do what God tells me to do, and I'm going to leave the rest to God. What's your purpose? Let's pray. God does give us the freedom to choose. Every parent here, regardless of how consistently or godly we've tried to raise our children, every parent knows what it feels like to watch our children grow up and exert their own will. Everyone. Sometimes that will blesses us, sometimes it grieves us. But that's the nature of life, freedom. God made us all with a will. Those of us that are parents sometimes try to force our will on our children, and we can do that while they're very young, but after a while we can't do that anymore. It just produces more rebellion. The world is filled with prodigals who resented their parents. You know how the story of the prodigal ended? How's your story going to end? You have the freedom to pursue whatever you want to pursue. Solomon and Ecclesiastes chapter 12, right after saying, let's hear, right before saying, let's hear the conclusion of the matter. He said, young men, delight in the desires of your heart. Pursue whatever your eyes see. But know for all this, God will bring you into judgment. Someday we're going to stand before the God who gave us life, who protected and preserved us through life. And beyond that, the God who gave his own life to free us from the power of sin. The God who hung on the cross and said, Father, forgive them. They don't understand what they're doing. The God who said, it is finished. I have come to give my life a ransom. Have you ever opened your heart up to that God? Because someday you're going to stand before him. And Jesus said, in that day, many will say to me, but Lord, Lord. But he said, I never knew you. Depart from me. Do you know him? Have you ever invited him? Have you ever acknowledged that what he did, he did for you? He has not taken and will not take away your freedom of choice. But have you chosen to respond to his love? To invite him to forgive you? To acknowledge that what he did, he did for your sin? To pay the price that a just and holy God demanded for sin? So that you can be a part of his plan, a part of his family? If you've not, why not? Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone, anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. God's waiting at the door of your heart. I can't open that door, and he won't open that door. You must choose whether you're going to open that door and acknowledge God as God and invite him to be your God, your Lord, your Savior. Many of you have done that. He didn't save you just to keep you out of hell. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that more abundantly. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give unto them eternal life. There's so much more God wants to direct you towards that which will really bring fulfillment ultimately. Are you willing to pursue his purpose? Father, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for